Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining our panel session. And I do believe it is the, the very last one of the day, so hopefully we'll make it a good one. I uh, wanted to introduce very quickly all of my esteemed panelists. So at my left is John Burbank. We also have Phil. We have Darius. We also have Masa and Nitin. And we'll all each go through and provide a very quick intro to what pro, uh, platform that we're currently involved in and how we got into crypto. So I'll, I'll kick off. Uh, I did a quick intro to sharing economies this morning, but the company that I run is called Red Pulse, and we have created a tokenized research ecosystem for China. Uh, John. Uh, John Burbank, uh, I've run a hedge fund for 18 years, got involved uh, per personally uh, 2013. I do a lot of startup investing, and my, I followed Bitcoin Tried to buy a lot of it in 2015, couldn't in a normal context in the hedge fund, and then figure out a way to do it last year. And now we've started several uh, hedge funds uh, focused on crypto. Uh, Phil Woods of the Bill Group. Um, I'm running or conducting an ICO later this month, but I'm not here to market or advertise that um, just because of local laws and regulations. Uh, I got involved in crypto because while working for my previous employer, we lost about $100 million, and I sat there thinking, how could we prevent this? And I realized that it was a perfect use case for blockchain. Hi, I'm Darius. Uh, I run QCP Capital. We are a fund management and trading firm. Uh, we run a few, of, a few uh, trading strategies, and we also do some OTC, and mar OTC market making. Um, we are also the first fully regulated uh, capital markets license holders in Singapore, allowing us to raise funds, platform other funds, as well as tokenize and securitize uh, assets. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Masa from Smart Contract Japan. I'm the CEO. Uh, we started off as the, one of the biggest crypto asset funds, uh, 500, mil, uh, 500 million USD. Uh, we have a massive portfolio. Uh, we kind of transformed to becoming the OTC traders nowadays. So we're the third biggest in the world. You have DRW Cumberland Mining, you got Circle, and we're probably the third but by volume, uh, biggest in Asia by far. And we just created a uh, system um, with Simplex uh, INC, uh, in-kind contribution in Ethereum. So that's never done in the world. So basically in Japan, Ethereum is considered as in new asset class in cash. Hi, uh, I'm Nitin Eepin. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Arcadia Crypto Ventures. We are a private fund. We invest only in cryptos. Besides that, uh, we back founders who come with ICOs, good ideas. Uh, these are the two main things that we do. We believe in, basically the whole idea is we believe in decentralization, freedom to people, and tokenization. We believe that in the future everything will be tokenized and we are betting on it. Great, thanks a lot guys. So to jump right into things, again, the panel is about investing and trading and the art of doing so. I wanted to get things a little bit uh, you know, interesting and start off on some topics that perhaps are more controversial in nature so that we're not constantly in violent agreement with each other, right? So the first one that I'd like to kick off on is the concept of market making. So as it pertains to conventional capital markets, simply put, it's providing liquidity in a market where there isn't enough of that. And oftentimes, as a market maker, you're the other side of the trade to ensure that there is enough trade activity and liquidity. But as it relates to crypto, uh, I think most people in this room are well aware that that definition of market making is much broader, right? And uh, market manipulation, you know, is, is oftentimes, you know, pointed at as, as a key activity that's under the guise of market making. And I wanted to start off with some quick thoughts from some of our panelists here as to what is the state of the industry when it comes to market making? What needs to change? And what are some of the catalysts that will drive that change? Okay, I'll start off. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my uh, brief intro, uh, we are working on a project uh, with a profound established uh, financial vendor. Now what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to pull in the dark pool liquidity and make it lit. So I would say ratio wise 70% is done in the OTC market and 30% is done in the exchange market. So we're trying to make that more transparent for the B2C, actually the customers, the retailers, to get a, a tighter spread, if you will. 
So in that sense, we are giving back to the ecosystem by creating infrastructure to, uh, it's basically a matching engine. Uh, we're gonna feed prices through API, but we're gonna have the, the big players, the big whales, like I mentioned, the DRWs, the Genesis, the Circles, these big players dark pool liquidity into our matching engine and feed that. So that's basically the next uh, project that we have in line. And this JV was formed, again, in kind contribution Ethereum. So, you know, you guys can, uh, uh, you know, promote this in the world. I mean, only in Japan, good or bad, it's, it's regulated. Right. And it's considered as an asset class. So you can actually create companies by using Bitcoin Ethereum. So, so just so that we understand this properly, this is addressing the liquidity issue uh, in the space, right? But in terms of market manipulation, right, it maybe is lessening the need or perhaps the, the, the prevalence of this taking place because there is more liquidity in the space and that sort of manipulation that is so prevalent right now may be harder to do, right? Indeed. Okay. So basically, I don't know if this system is really going to, you know, build more transparency. I mean, that's the aim, the goal that we have. Okay. Uh, because if, as you mentioned, there's market manipulation still, um, and these big whales, so-called, or dolphins, still control the market. And uh, that's why even, I mean, if you can look back to the NDF days, you know, non-deliverable forwards. I mean, all the brokers in the, in the big investment banks were holding, and they, they had all the information. So this is what ha is happening right now in the crypto world. Basically, you need to uh, bring in this pool of liquidity and make it more transparent by sure. using systems and infrastructures. So. Well, I, I think the problem uh, with market making and market manipulation is a knowledge gap. So for us, you know, when we say that we are market makers on a daily basis, we have uh, ICO projects that come to us and say, okay, you know, I provide market making. They're like, okay, great. Uh, how many X can you get me? Um, that's a problem. I mean, it's, it, uh, you know, it's, there's a difference between market making and manipulation and liquidity provision. So our answer is usually we provide liquidity. So it's a matter of understanding that in the long term, having uh, liquidity provision is better than the 5x at the start. Uh, and, and that's a more sustainable way of maintaining uh, liquidity in your coin as well. So it's more about education and, and also about having proper incentives. Yeah, I, I would just add that there's an R word that we rarely like to talk about, and that's regulation. And so if the community proves it, it is unable, unable or incapable of self-regulating, then we will have very strict rules imposed upon us to ensure that you don't have exchanges doing what are effectively watch trades, where they're moving Bitcoin and Ethereum from one book to another internally and then reporting that external as a volume just to to drive more traffic onto their site. And so what Darius just said is, is quite true. There's a difference between li liquidity and market manipulation. And it just takes a level of transparency on some of these exchanges and, and some of these dark pools, unfortunately, uh, to tell us what's real. Because if, if, I'm try if I'm bidding for something and I can't get it because you're just trading with yourself internally as an exchange, then you're manipulating the market. But if there's a real price there that I can either, what we like to say, lift or hit, then that's real liquidity. And so if we don't know what's true, then regulators will eventually impose truth upon us. And I'd rather we just do it as a, as a community as opposed to having the imposition of, of say, order. Sure. Yeah. How are we going to get to that point, though? Because if, if we need to do so as a community or have it be basically pushed down upon us by regulators, I mean, I, I agree. I, I would much prefer it be done from the community level. But is there something that needs to happen? Maybe some major negative event needs to happen before people start moving? Uh, I would say, uh, I, I believe in the free markets, okay? So I think we will work it out, okay? Rather than regulation coming upon us, whether it comes also, it, that'll be f like John earlier said, you know, it'll be formalized, you know, market manipulation. Rather than that, you see, we would, I would rather have it, we'll figure it out because some of these guys are gonna do it, okay? I, I agree to that. There is gonna be market manipulation and uh, we just have to wait it out because I, I, I don't think people are dumb. They will choose to go, to go to an exchange that does not do it eventually. So that's how we will, we, that means the market will punish them. For the guys who are doing market, uh, this market manipulation, they'll do pump and dump once, twice, and then they'll get caught and you know, they'll be stuck with their positions. 
something right. like that will happen. Okay. Yeah, I would say, you know, the U.S. stock market, I think, was operated like this for 50, 60 years, you know, where it was massive, you know, you couldn't understand. It was costly to trade. It had wild swings, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was probably very hard to, to regulate, and there weren't many regulators. And right. so I think it's kind of like this, but this is all going to be very compressed. Um, and I think this is a business opportunities for people who want to bring, you know, world-class technology to bear here to illuminate, you know. I, I mean, th th there is this sizable liquidity that creates incentive for people to create systems that address problems. And so I, I think the attention this is getting now, what I see from really uh, accomplished uh, financial tech people uh, now attacking these problems, I think it's going to get solved by the private market. Hmm. But I mean, if it's not solved in six months, it's not like a, such a big problem, right? Really? It's no. Okay. It's this is you, as long as you understand that this is that it's going part on. Of it. I also think reputation um, matters uh, a lot um, across the board, and so you know the market learns and uh, people pass information really quickly, and so you know eventually you get you get known, you get found out, and then the market the liquidity goes somewhere else. Right. Yeah, I did notice also that it's highly reputational in this space, and, and your name is incredibly valuable. The moment that you ruin your name, that's it. You're out, you're out of the market. People, people will remember that, and it'll follow you. Okay, well, switching gears a bit, and wanting to hear a little bit more about the different types of strategies to investment and to trading in crypto, uh, why don't we go across the panel here and share a couple of views on what strategies have worked out the best for you thus far, and which ones you think are more sustainable in nature rather than temporary. Well, I'll start. The, uh, the strategies that I'm most interested in right now um, are, are uh, arbitrage strategies. Um, so again, I'm seeing, I'm seeing people bringing technology to, you know, the, 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 the opportunity is not only the fundamental long-term you know, opportunity. It's how do you take advantage of liquidity and all these different exchanges at all these different prices and, and create money out of that, profit out of that. The returns available in ARB are so much higher in this space than anything traditional. So I find that to be the most compelling. And so we have found a few uh, people to work with. Um, this, is not, this is not stuff that we have ourselves, but we're partnering with, uh, with uh, two different managers who are doing this. And uh, I expect we're going to see a lot more. Now, I've, I've always been fascinated by how these arbitrage opportunities still continue to exist. Because in conventional capital markets, that sort of opportunity would be essentially traded away almost instantaneously. And what do you think are some of the reasons for why they still exist today? If you look at just across two or three of the major exchanges, the price spread is, is vast. And is it because there's not enough uh, institutional money in it? Is there, is there not enough bots that are trading out the, the arbitrage opportunities? What's, what's going on here? You've got all these different exchanges. I mean, okay. You've got high vol. I mean, actually, the late 90s was like this in that you had really high volatility. You had... Um, you had very large ARBs available, but people didn't care about those because they were looking at the, right, how to, how to profit from the, the volatility, mm. you know, like the, the upside. Okay. So I, f I find it similar situation. It will be ARBed out. Okay. The question is, does it take one year or five years or whatever? But I'm just saying that there are, because all that liquidity is not likely to go away, right? The attention, the global attention on this is so dramatic. Uh, I think that is something that you can look at as, as, as uh, doing something sophisticated here and not just have to be binary, long, you know, or sh being short is not that easy. Right. And, and only recently could you really be short. Um, but in any, in any case, it's a good thing to have that in the market, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's coming. It'll be more and more happening. Sure. Phil? Yeah, I, I would say the more interesting strategies I would term as battle of the bots. And traditionally, like from my background, I would look at things from a very systematic perspective. Um, you would do your back data, your quant models, put those together. But what you find is a thesis probably only lasts for 24, 48 hours in this kind of a market. And so I do think to John's point, 
If you look at just the price of BTC, even if you price it in dollars, but you trade it at various points of the day or even in various geographies, ge excuse me, geographies at the exact same time of day, you can have wild price differences. And mm -hmm. so if you're talking about just pure alpha generation, arbitrage is the number one strategy right now. Hmm. Okay. So um, at our side, we run two core strategies. The first strategy is a quant strategy. Look, we look quite, quite uh, closely at volatility and correlations to be systematically long. And the second strategy is actually an ARP strategy. And, and on this point, I actually disagree with John that, that it will be ARP out. Because um, you look at the, tr the, the traditional markets today, you have a contract like the Nikkei contract. Uh, it's extremely efficient. Uh, traded across three big exchanges, uh, not 100% fungible, uh, and even though it's efficient, you still get you still get up up, tra up trades within that that efficient market. Uh, when you talk, look at crypto, you're talking about a thousand different exchanges across many different borders with different capital controls. So for us, the cross border arbitrage and the latency arbitrage, I think it will always be there in some degree. Uh, it might, it might shrink here and there, but uh, you know, over time, with the regu regulatory volatility as well, there will always be upcharge opportunities. Yeah, uh, I hate to say, but probably our would be okay. our strategy as well. <laughs> right. uh, um, I would say more so geographical ARB, uh, because of the fact that uh, I think it was reversed. And back in the days, it was, there was a premium in America. We would uh, buy lower in Japan, sell higher in, in, in the US for the other states. Now it was kind of reversed. Uh, we buy, le uh, you know, at like a two, p two plus, three plus, and then we sell it at ten plus here. So the geographical arb, of course, the local arb between exchanges, we call it the local arb, uh, the FX arb, of course. Um, but arb is supposed to be against the futures, no? So I mean, if there's a Bitcoin futures, it's supposed to be if you re replicate in the commodity you know, uh, market, it should be against the futures, but uh, it's more so geographical, local exchanges. So once it gets transparent and the market matures, I think there's gonna be less opportunities, but ARB is still our strategy. We, we used to do ARB. Uh, we are not doing uh, much ARB anymore because it's not easy when you're a bigger fund to do ARB. So if you're doing very little bit of, um, such a small amount of Bitcoin, it's much easier. See, one problem is if you're trying to do ARB, let's say if you're doing it between, let's take GDAX and Bitfinex or Binance. Okay, uh, now let's, uh, let's take Bitf Bitfinex because you, the time to move your Bitcoin, let's say you make a sell over here because it's higher, you don't know how long it'll take to transfer on the other side or either you have to have a position over there to use that. How many times can you do that? How, how, how much? you need to have in hand to do that as a question. So for us, we have changed that strategy and we are just kind of taking that big bet. This is, we are believing in the whole space. We are believing in the market and we are gonna bet in the market. Now when we're doing all these in, in and out of trading, there's taxes that we're gonna lose. So instead of that, we're just planning to stay long. The other piece is because there are these violent swings, so let's say I'm doing buy low, sell high, I'm, I'm doing a multiple trades, I'm, I'm capturing a small amount, okay? But in between, this thing is jumping 10% up. So if I was not long, I missed that 10%. So we kind of calculated over the last two years, and we kind of figured out, I would say we, before 2017, we figured out that we are missing those big jumps. And every time the fall happens, we're getting the fall anyway. So instead of that, we just decided we're just gonna stay long, we're gonna keep buying, whether it's high or low, we're just gonna keep buying every month or every day, whatever is the time. We feel that's more efficient for us because we don't have to worry about this so that we can concentrate on finding new founders in, at that time. So a, very much a buy and hold strategy there. Yeah, we are hardcore hardless. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. It doesn't matter if this falls 50%, we're not taking money from outside so it's easy for sure. us to do it. I, I don't think it's easy if I were a fund, if I had taken outside money, my investors would be yelling at me. But I'm saying if you're a retail investor, just stay there. If you believe in it, see the, the whole thing comes from your belief in this decentralization. If you don't believe in it, you can't do it. So the first thing is, do you believe in it? And if you believe in it, what's your goal? Do you want to capture the small gains and not hit a big loss? Or do you want to hit the ball out of the park for the next 10 years? So it's on your belief and your goal. Decide that first, then do it. Hmm. Yeah, but if it goes down 90%, 
you would have wished you didn't do that. Yeah, at and, all, right? And, <laughs> and the, the way it's, it's feeling right now is like there's a, there's a good chance that this whole complex goes down 80%. Hmm. I mean, okay. it's easier 90. to hit it out of the park if you start at the bottom sure. and you... I mean, the rebound will be extraordinary because the, the whole sure. world will be watching. Yep. But this, this is now reminding me more and more of the emerging market crisis uh, in started at the end of 97 and 98, where in a year, um, you know, Korea went down 90% in dollars and Indonesia went down 95% in dollars, the whole index. And what's profound about 95% versus 90, it seems like it's the, you know, so close together. But to, to get to down 95, you get to down 90 and then you lose 50% of your money to get to, to, to 95. <laughs> So the, the liquidity is just the balancing of buyers and sellers at that moment. It has nothing to do with the future. Mm. I mean, this future fundamental value, whatever you think is going to happen three years from now, or even one year from now. So the problem, the, the, I just want to say this for the audience, the, the, the issue with price is that it's, the, it's wherever liquidity balances. And right now, there's not a lot of offsets Right? And institutional money is not coming this year, from what I can tell. And so the question is, who is the other buyer? And um, that's the, anyway, I, I just, I would recommend to, to dealing in the financial crisis and dealing in that, in that time, because in, in, I was doing emerging markets then, a good strategy is to have half cash, half position. Or to be just all in cash and knowing, psychologically being freed, you know, not being distracted by the, the drop. And what I like about arbitrage is you can stay involved in the market and feel like you're doing something productive while waiting for the, you know, the liquidity to balance at a price where it's not going to go up. I just mm. think it's, it's really worth talking about that because you know, the railroads went through something similar. The railroads were like crypto you know, <laughs> when we were building railroads. That's the true. problem was there wasn't enough demand. Right. right. So they built all these railroads. They all went bust. And then it basically it was people like Vanderbilt who then bought up the debt, pennies on the dollar, and put together, you know, over many years, a huge transportation, you know, company. So this is going to happen much quicker, but the point is, if this bus lasts a year, you're miserable, probably. And so you have to deal with that. I, I agree with John on that. See, that is where I said it's... It's, it's very hard to time these things. So it's like you have to take a sure. stand. We, we just took a stand that, you know, we don't want to do that. It doesn't matter to us if you're going to zero. We, we've kind of, that's, that's our decision. Okay? It's a lot but, easier if it's your own money though, right? Right. It, it is easier yeah. for us because it's our own money. Right. I, I agree that I can't do it with a fund, but I'm telling for retail investors, if you're doing with your money, see, you have to pick a point. Uh, like for us, it was like, it doesn't matter. So we, every month we buy. Hmm. It doesn't matter for us whether it's, we, we are always averaging okay. at this point. Yeah, interesting. So who is going to be that other buyer though, John? You were saying that the Asian financial crisis and other crises like so, that eventually got to a point where liquidity balanced and there was a buyer of those assets finally at the price to which it dropped. So, so I remember flying to Korea to meet with this one insurance analyst. Yep. Um, there were 11 insurance companies and the whole sector was worth less than $500 million. And she said I was the only investor who actually cared and, and visited. It's hard to, hard to believe that a place like Korea could have no interest after it went down 90%, okay. but, but it, it did not. Yeah. Um, and so the, the, the emerging markets were the, this new asset class that everybody was incredibly positive on. They were very expensive, and then it crashed. And of course, these were sovereigns that had also issues, et cetera. Mm. But what I'm saying is that you, know, you go through this in your history, and you realize, like, Price is just because of liquidity. It's not because of bubbles and, 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 and busts. So, um, but I do believe the, the Bitcoin and the equivalence of store value is a universal need. I think it's recognized. It's you know, nine years old. Um, I'd say that there's a reason why Bitcoin will probably go down least, hold up best, be the most liquid, you know, have the best chance of uh, upside. I, 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 we're waiting for when these, when there is the ability to have utility in utility tokens. There are many promising things, but they have to be used, right? right? Okay. Yeah, I, I actually see it a little bit differently. I don't think you necessarily need to have a natural buyer of what exists right now in the crypto space. 
because this is a space unlike other asset classes where you can re-engineer, reinvent literally overnight. And so I'm actually expecting more of a rotation and a shift from some of the existing projects, the existing coins, into ones that are quite honestly backed by businesses that actually have a utility and businesses that produce profit. Because at the end of the day, no matter what asset class you, you're buying, you're purchasing, it has to have a profit motive behind it. If not, then you've just created a door key. And I think crypto is just far more interesting than creating door keys, sure. digital door keys. So what you'll see, I think, is people moving out of these projects that over the past 18 months have had great hype, great fanfare, but ultimately it's too theoretical to produce something that people who aren't interested in crypto would actually buy. And so I'm not worried about a natural buyer for, and I won't call it project, but some of the projects that we've seen that we've all kind of talked about and said that looks like a pump and dump scheme. I'm just looking for the projects, like some of the ones that are mentioned up here on this panel where people say, you know what, I'm tired of waiting six months for this team to produce a product. I'm gonna buy something else where they actually already have a product. Sure. Yeah. And we heard earlier about the concept of reverse ICOs, which, you know, somewhat confusing name aside, uh, is essentially those companies that already have an established track record are revenue generative, very likely already profit generating, and are now looking at creating a tokenized business model, maybe as a separate platform, but that seems to be a trend nowadays, right? And having those utilities and the value that is borne out by that reside in the value of the token itself. It's very interesting. I, I, I mean, the idea of a natural buyer in this case, I think if you take two steps back and you look at the entire crypto space, the market cap right now is about 250 billion. That's about the size of the cash balance sheet of a single bank. So uh, I think in terms of natural buyers, it's just a knowledge gap at the moment. Uh, there will definitely be some, you know, there will be definitely be some reallocation of old money, just a little bit. You know, you have natural buyers right there. Sure. The question is, uh do we, you know, a business, a natural business, does it need to have tokens? What, what are they trying to do? Are they putting an old wine in a new bottle at that point? Uh, if it's a natural business and that they are making money, should they be trying to tokenize it? I, I don't get it. So I'm very wary of those. Maybe tomorrow it will be a day that they are doing good. Like tomorrow it could be security tokens, it could be businesses. But today it is a utility thing that's driving it. No, see, more than utility is speculation that's driving it. I agree, okay? It is, there's no real use. But businesses coming as tokens, I, I don't know. I would rather buy the company with a cash flow at that time. You know, if I want to buy cash flow, I buy cash flow. There's a tokenizing it, I don't see, at least right now. Maybe it's gonna change. Okay. Always good to have some differing viewpoints, you know. Uh, I think that's a good segue actually into another topic that wanted to touch upon, and with all the volatility in this space and the price fluctuations, more recently very much downwards rather than upwards, there's a lot of talk about stable coins and a little bit of discussion there, but from an investment perspective, what's your outlook on this concept? We've seen Tether, but there's a lot of talk of other types of stable coins on the horizon. Anyone care to comment? Uh, personally, I wouldn't buy a stable coin because uh I'm not, into, uh, I'm, I'm not investing in, in this to be in a stable coin business. I, I'm investing my money to see if there's an upside because I believe in the space. What is a stable coin? Like, can't I buy a US dollar at that point? Or what, what does a stable coin do? Is it going to keep Bitcoin at 5,000 all the time? What is that number? 10,000? 5,000? 15,000? So I know some of the guys, they are telling that, you know, because they can't use it at a store because this thing is fluctuating. I'm like, don't use it at a store. You can use it for something else. I, I don't get it. I, I've never understood the concept of a stable coin. I understand USD Tether because they're saying, okay, you're having a coin instead of the dollar, which helps uh, settlement and all those kind of things. But otherwise, I don't get it. I don't buy it unless somebody can really explain it to me. I mean, so I used to be a macro trader and, uh, and then, you know, these guys come and say, um, I want to have a stable coin that's pegged to a certain value. Um, and for guys who have sat through something like a Euro-Swiss crisis, where the Swiss National Bank couldn't sustain holding a flaw on the currency. So, you know, my question is always, what makes you think you can control the peg? Uh, and if you have a stable coin that is controlled on both sides, meaning upside and downside, you are creating uh, wrong incentives. You know, you, if somebody comes to short the coin to break your peg, they actually make both ways because you are defending both sides. So it actually makes no sense. 
Yeah, for, for some of these um, hard-capped ICOs where they don't have uh, subdivision out to the 18th decimal place, I think they're going to find defending those levels quite hard because one thing that we don't talk about a lot in this community is just really it's some perverse human psychology at work sometimes. And so people naturally always want to challenge other people. And when you stand out, you hold your hand in the market and say, I will not allow X to happen, there's always 10 other people who will say, I bet I can make right. X happen. You paint a target on your own back, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. So you're, you're holding your hand up and saying, shoot me, I can take all the bullets. Yeah. So I just think it's an, a fundamentally dumb idea. And mm. if, if Darius said, I mean, I, I remember working at Citigroup, and you're sitting there watching the price of a foreign asset, something as liquid as the Swiss franc. And if the Swiss National Bank can't control that and peg the price of it, what would make you think you can control the price of the tokens or the coins from your smart contract? I mean, not everybody runs the Ripple business model where you can just simply issue your way out of it. So I think there are some people who aren't thinking through the third and fourth order effects of a decision to have a stable coin. Personally, uh, to run our business, we are very pro-tether, let's put it that way. Uh, not about stable coin, but why we're pro-tether is because of the fact that it's instantaneous settlement. So in the OTC world, uh, T plus zero is mandatory. It, this is from crypto to fiat, by the way. So in that sense, um, if we have a JPY tether, for instance, in Japan, this is going to help us a lot because we do have banks like Silvergate uh, that are doing it already. But I mean, T plus zero instantaneous settlement is going to be something crucial if you want to, you know, um, do your rounds on a simultaneous basis. So in that sense. Stable coin, kind of vague. We're still not really a believer, but Tether, yes. My personal opinion. Thank you. Good points, guys. Uh, moving on to another topic that I think is very much front and center on most people's minds. How do we get into, this, into the situation that we're in now? Essentially, we're in a massive bear market. Nobody in the room is happy. Uh, I, I don't think anybody's happy, actually. And if you are, please raise your hand, uh, and I'll congratulate you. But how do we get into... Oh, yeah? Okay. Good stuff, guys. You know, uh, we, we can talk later. But uh, you know, how do we get into the position that we are today? And what are things that are on the horizon that are potentially going to be the catalysts that bring us out? Uh, one thing I found interesting is that nowadays, I mean, from, okay, if you would pertain BTC, I mean, it's highly correlated, right? The BTC goes down, the Ether, all the altcoins go down. I believe right now what's happening um, in these two or three months, or maybe in this last month, is uh, the miners selling off. I mean, so there's a break-even point of how the miners can actually, okay, to, I think to mine one BTC, the average, the mean right now is probably around roughly 7,000. So that is a break-even point. So you can tell that, I can't keep names, but B or G, Han, maybe, is selling these things off, right, guys, to uh, support their rigs and whatnot. So that's insider information, guys, right there. But um, that is the break-even point. And I, I've seen, like, uh, Venezuela is, I think, supposed to be the, the less cheapest with $531. South Korea is supposed to be, like, 26000 So the mean, basically, what I'm trying to say is 7000 So they're trying to lower that to the break-even point. So that's what's happening right now, mm. to be honest. Okay. Just went up too much. Went up too much. Okay. And then, and then, uh, and then the crackdown. You know, the regulatory wise. And, yes, and so, and so that that just reduced liquidity. Um, you know, shut off buyers. So you have all this attention and interest, but now you've had this, this change, and and then the, at some point, it's like, you know, playing spoons or something. At some point, you realize, oh my God, I got to grab a spoon, yeah. you know, or I'm out of the game. Like, right. So people are grabbing liquidity as it goes down. They're realizing the buyers aren't there. Yeah. Even though they all believe and the people who are all there are buyers longer term. And so this is what I'm saying. It's like you've got to separate long-term fundamental belief and value from this short-term game. Unfortunately, it's a painful game if, you're, if you lose of grabbing liquidity. And so the, the marginal cost of production generally matters in mining and business generally because you can't do that for very long. 
But you know, the history of, of financial markets is it can go down through that cost for quite some time. And, uh, and then you have opportunity, and then a whole different mindset takes over, which is value. And so already you have um, you know, situations of, uh, of, well, you've got the situation of IC, people raise money, put it in ether, and then ether goes down way more than they ever expected, and suddenly they have a problem. Or the issue where they turn it into cash, right? And it all went down, and they're in a great situation, right? So, you know, the, the repudiation of cash is probably being reevaluated a little bit um, by everyone because mm -hmm. that's the stable coin, you know, in the universe, <laughs> the, the original, like it or not. The original stable coin, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, to John's point, uh, he just mentioned the word value, and I just want to leave everybody with the impression that I don't think there's anybody on this stage right now who is bearish the overall market. Yes, we, we tend to have a sell off right now, but. This is the time when you're supposed to buy. I mean, let's take a step back and not just talk about crypto. Hmm. If Warren Buffett were invested in crypto, he would be buying every day right now. Yeah. Simply because he has a long-term time horizon, right? There's blood on the streets. Right? It, exactly. And so there are people who will say, wait a second, I just, I really, really need to sell. And he'll say, okay, I'll buy all the crypto you want me to, you want me to. But step, taking a step back, I think what really rescues this market as, is the emergence of the token economy. So like right now, if you look at a project like T0, um, T0, because they wanted to do a quasi-regulated offering, they needed to have something called a transfer agent to officially look at who's buying the coin and keep a record of that. Well, right now, that's actually done using the Microsoft CSV file. Microsoft Excel. It's not even on blockchain, hmm. the provider who does it for them. I'm not going to say their name because I don't want to out them. But they're one of the largest transfer agents in the world, and you can go Google that and find out who they are. The point of it is, is that there are parts of blockchain, there are parts of the use cases that people just have not used yet that will provide oxygen to this space. It will provide uh, greater investment. And then that is when institutional money will follow, when people start to see the connection. Blockchain does two things. It either stores data or it transmits data in a secure fashion. And when people just wrap their head around that very simple concept, they'll see that it applies in almost every business in every geography. And then that will add greater liquidity and greater investment in the space. So be patient, have guts, have your conviction, but as John said, have a stop loss as well. Yeah, I mean, Master pointed out something earlier, right? That, that the OTC market is a lot bigger than, than the exchange market. So the price discovery is actually happening on a very small portion of the liquidity. So you get incredible price swings that might not be real. And again, my point is that you take two steps back, the, the value is, is in the, um, the size of the space. It's too, still too small. Um, once the infrastructure comes in that allows uh, family officers and real money to actually deploy properly. I mean, we, I've had discussions with uh, many hedge funds, including my own former hedge funds, that, that just say they, they just can't do it. They have a lot of willingness to, but they just can't. Uh, too many... Uh, tail risks in terms of regulation and in terms of uh, ops systems, you know, simple things, really, really simple things. The, and, and once these problems are solved, you'll get greater participation, the market cap, cap will just grow. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah that, 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 that I agree because uh, you know, what Darius said is correct. You know, once the funds can come in, you know, once the custody solutions come in, the funds can come in. And there are, there are places still regulation is stopping it, like you take China or India. There, there's two billion people out there who, have not, who can't even realistically enter the market, the retail market itself. So there is still, so, this is like, I would say it's only the third or third, end of the third innings of a nine innings game. This is, this is a long game and it, it is, you have to be patient. This is, there's no other option for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. yeah just to, to, to Nathan's point about regulations, so we're going through this process to register our, our ICO in the U.S. and you, you submit your document to the SEC, you're quite excited, you're like, wow, we'll be one of the first. And then they send you a question and they say, well, do you need a license agreement to create an ERC-20 contract on Ethereum? And everyone on my team, we were sitting there and we're reading this and we don't know whether to laugh or to cry because clearly the regulator doesn't understand just the basic foundations of a decentralized economy or a decentralized system. And so it takes time to, to educate people. And sure. so with, with education, you'll see greater adoption. And as Nathan said, this is third inning at best. Mm. Okay. Great. Masa, anything to add to this point? No? Okay. Well, we have a couple minutes left. And very uh, happy to open it up to any questions from the floor for any of our panelists. 
No? Going once? Okay. Thank you. Um, so if I get this right, um, you said that the price is being based on low liquidity and most of the trades are being done uh, OTC. Isn't that a manipulation? Is it a question to... Uh, is it a question directed to somebody or anybody can answer it? Okay. See, price discovery, just because it's OTC doesn't mean it's manipulation because OTC, people do OTC because they have large volumes to trade and they, don't, they can't do it on an exchange. You go to an exchange, let's say if I want to sell 1,000 BTC, I can't sell it in one shot. So I would go to an OTC desk. They might charge me more, but it's easier for me to do it. Uh, if you look at an exchange from, from a GDAX perspective, because we trade a lot on GDAX, uh, the difference for when Bitcoin was at 20,000 on, a, on a, any regular day when there's not huge price things, the, the spread is just one cent. You can't trade a stock, any stock on the New York Stock Exchange, which is at even five, uh, even a thousand dollars stock, there is no bid as spread at one cent at that point. So I, I don't think that is manipulation just because it's at the OTC desk. Yeah, if I may add, um, that's right. I mean, manipulation, I mean, you can, you know, perceive it in many ways, I think. There's a lot of meaning to it. Um, when I said in the OTC market, there may be manipulation is, is because of the fact that the ratio is seven to three. Uh, you know, there's a lot of front runners. There's a lot of insider information. As uh, you mentioned as well, like basically there's a lot of bulk trades. So if I'm seeing flows of, you know, 1,000 BTCs and like 10,000 ethers selling off, then it kind of know where the market is going. So in that sense, we could manipulate in a way. It's just I'm just saying um, that the it is still OTC driven, and that's why we are trying to build an infrastructure to make uh, the the market more transparent and fair in that sense. So I don't know uh, if I'm not, if I'm answering your question or not, but uh, I'll leave it to these guys as well. Yeah, uh, I think I think that was a pretty good response. So any other questions from the floor? I'd like to hear some predictions from the panelists, from the price predictions or any, any kind of predictions they want to make. I wish I had that crystal ball okay, to see gonna, the future. Yeah, hey, how, gonna, how much are you willing to pay for this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anybody, anybody want to take this one? Uh, no, I, I, personally, if, if I knew that, I, as I always say, I would have taken my kidney out, I would have l leased it, and, you know, or take, uh, and then I would have bet on it. So I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. Even the guys who write out there, it's going to go to 20,000. When it doesn't go, they change it. So I, I never make a price prediction. Yeah. Are you a strong believer in the ecosystem, the blockchain, the technology that's driving, that's fueling it? Then I think it's a buy and hold. It's still long. I mean, it's a bloody blast right now, as you mentioned. Um, <laughs> super relatively low, don't you think? Um, if there's, okay, per se, Ethereum protocol, if there's applications that's gonna be really running on the, the, the Ethereum protocol, besides CryptoKitties, then you'll see a spark in the whole, right? So you never know, but uh, we're all, I think, strong believers here. So you gotta stay strong here, right? I think good words to, well, I was just going to say, comment. you're taking tremendous risk owning one thing, you know, or limiting what you own to just a few things. And even Bitcoin, it's not, we don't know that it's going to be the store of value winner. It's likely to be, but so I would just say that you actually increase your odds of winning the more diversified you are, but also weighted towards the most liquid, largest sure. uh, things. Yeah. Okay. And index holding, basically. Index, right. the hold the market. Exactly. And Bitcoin's about half of the whole index now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, appreciate it, guys. Very, very good points to end on. Uh, we've run out of time, but let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists today. John, Phil, Darius, Masa, and Nitin. Thank you very much, guys.